Friday, November 2nd, 2018, six days after the horrific act of anti-Semitism at the Tree of Life or Simcha building, one Shabbat prior, where 11 innocent Jews were killed. Four words printed atop the morning's post-gazette, Yit Kadal vi Kadash Shemei Rabbah, because words failed even those who earned their living through words. Eighteen and one half years after another act of anti Semitism and racism here in Pittsburgh's South Hills killed a Jewish woman, a black man, and individuals of Chinese, Indian, and Vietnamese descent. Friday, November 2nd, 2018. Hundreds of people gathered in the sanctuary here at Temple Emmanuel of South Hills. Hundreds of people gathered in the sanctuary at Temple De Hirsch Sinai in Seattle. Hundreds more gathered in Temple Israel's in Omaha and Memphis and Long Beach. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people rallied around the American Jewish Committee's hashtag show up for Shabbat initiative, packing synagogues in what became the largest ever expression of solidarity with the American Jewish community. The amazing part of this is that most of the attendees weren't even Jewish. Raising a collective voice for a world free of anti-Semitism, hate, and bigotry, millions of Americans stepped off the sidelines, stepped out from behind their computer screens and out of their homes to attend rallies and services, meetings and memorials in support of the Jewish community. We were surrounded in solidarity by those who recognized the truth of AJC CEO David Harris's words, it was not only an assault on the Jewish community, it was an assault on our American values. Values of tolerance and empathy, of treating others with kindness and recognizing shared humanity despite, ideally because of, differences were assaulted that day through another particularistic attack on the Jewish community. Make no mistake, no student of Jewish history was surprised that this could happen. We were only surprised that it would happen here. Our community knows too well from anti-Semitism to believe otherwise, both individuals acting on their prejudices and discriminating institutionalized barriers to success. The first, Individuals acting on their prejudices and those prejudices manifesting in hate speech or violent actions are widely condemned in our civil society. From acts of ignorance like swastikas drawn on school bathroom doors here in Mount Lebanon to acts of violence against visibly Jewish members of the Pittsburgh community spurred by tensions between Israel and the Palestinians, we hear about these incidents on TV and in newspapers and in annual reports by the FBI because they're widely agreed to be abhorrent and thus their perpetration is newsworthy. Overt acts of discrimination, we've decided, are wrong, and we have a framework for calling out and punishing offenders and rallying behind victims. The second form of anti-Semitism and discrimination, those that formed institutionalized barriers to success, have not been present in the news. Television stations didn't call out the Duquesne Club or the Pittsburgh Club or the St. Clair Country Club for excluding Jews from shutting us out of backroom business deals and opportunities to climb the social ladder. Newspapers weren't talking about Jews being excluded from Virginia Manor in Mount Lebanon or Westminster Manor in Upper St. Clair, neighborhoods that were reserved for Christian whites and federal authorities didn't end the policy of restricting the number of Jewish students accepted to universities and medical schools, including the University of Pittsburgh Medical School, until the 1960s. These institutionalized barriers weren't publicized in the same way individual attacks are, but they were ever present in the lives of the Jewish community. Talk to any Jew from that generation to learn more. And for generations, they held the community back from even greater success. In her seminal work, How Jews Became White Folks, Professor Karen Brodkin writes, my parents' generation believed that Jews overcame anti-Semitic barriers because Jews are special. 
It's become part of our ethnic heritage, she writes, to believe that Jews were smart and that our success was due to our own efforts and abilities, reinforced by a culture that valued sticking together hard work, education, and deferred gratification. It's our own Jewish Horatio Alger story, a narrative of the Jewish community pulling itself up by its bootstraps. And these abilities and ideals do and did contribute to Jews' upward mobility. But as Professor Brodkin writes, that alone was insufficient to account for our success. The Jews' acceptance by their white Protestant neighbors were affected by changes in national economic, institutional, and political practices, as well as by changes in scientific and public discourse about race in general and about Jews in particular. The rate of college attendance and professional jobs skyrocketed in the Jewish community after World War II, courtesy of the GI Bill, an affirmative action program for white males that was functionally withheld from blacks as colleges and labor were still segregated. Mortgage tax credits and reduction in residential redlining, at least for Jews, added to Jewish wealth. American empathy and identification with the nascent state of Israel, which we wrongly believed to be white, added to political power. Racial segregation outlasted and outlast religious segregation in America. We escaped the burden of systemic institutionalized barriers to success, but we didn't dismantle them. We sidestepped their crushing weight by being accepted into the white American majority. And we see now from the other side of the barrier, that burden falling squarely on the black community. While there is no comparison to be made between the types or degrees of harm inflicted on Jews and blacks in America, our own history is to know from categories of discrimination, both individuals acting on their own prejudices and systemic institutionalized barriers to success that have taken central stage in the American public discourse today. That debate goes something like this. Does racism in America exist only because of a few bad apples, individuals who act on their individual prejudices through hate speech and violent action? Or is it possible that there are institutionalized structural disadvantages that blacks have faced and do face across American society? We know this history. We lived a cognate of this history. We cannot stand idly by, much less become complicit in attempts to erase or whitewash this history and this reality. Attempts to do just that have been proliferating in the South Hills and across America today at school board meetings and on talk shows under the umbrella of impugning critical race theory. In case you're like me and not familiar with that term until now, let's take a quick look Formerly a term of art in the academic legal community, critical race theory suggests that racism isn't confined to a few bad apples, but can be embedded within systems and institutions within our society. A teacher, for example, who is more likely to discipline a black student than a white student for the same infraction could be seen as individually racist. Black children, however, being disciplined at three times the rate of white children for the same infraction at schools across America speaks to a structural challenge rather than a challenge with America's teachers. Because we've never seriously confronted our sordid history with slavery, with segregation, and with discrimination, the theory goes, attempts to be colorblind or to ignore race when thinking about public policy don't demonstrate neutrality, but rather risk perpetuating harmful systems. In 2020, this theory made its way from intellectual dissection and discussion to cable news punditry at the hands of one Christopher Rufo. On the Fox News program Tucker Carlson tonight, Mr. Rufo set out to make critical race theory, in his words, the perfect villain. Conservatives need to wake up, he said. This is an existential threat to the United States. Rufo describes critical race theory 
Again, the recognition that racism can be present as systemic institutionalized barriers like those we know from our own lived experience as, quote, Marxist, anti-capitalist, anti-constitution, and anti-American. Rufo's manufactured outrage continues on the airwaves and at local school board meetings as a tool to help win elections. I've spoken with school board members, with administrators, with principals in a number of our surrounding school districts, Peters Township, Upper St. Clair, Mount Lebanon, and more, who report increasing, insistent, alarmist efforts to ensure that race, let alone critical race theory, isn't discussed in classrooms. To a person, they're baffled by the emotional vehemence against this grad school level concept that's not even part of the curriculum and by the singularity of voices that they are hearing. We, the Jewish community, who know from both individuals acting on their prejudices and discriminating institutionalized barriers to success, who know the value of solidarity when Others left the comfort of their homes and computer screens to attend rallies and services, meetings and memorials. We, the Jewish community, cannot let this singularity of voice because we're uninformed or uninterested. We've got some learning to do. We've got some advocacy to do. And we've got to do it rather quickly. It starts with learning. Don't take my word for what critical race theory is or isn't. Take a look for yourselves. Seek out not those who want to opine about the concept, talking heads and people who stand to benefit politically by telling you what to think, but seek out those who will teach about the concept itself for you to compare to your own understanding, your own lived experience, your own perceptions of the world. Pick up Dr. Karen Brodkin's book, How the Jews Became White Folk. Study the writings of Kimberly Crenshaw and Derek Bell. Strip away the hot-button political shtus and study the concept itself. Spoiler alert, Virginia Manor, the Duquesne Club, and Pitt Med didn't just exclude Jews. Once you've better understood the underpinnings of critical race theory, make your voice heard. We who know from institutionalized systemic barriers cannot be complicit in attempts to erase or whitewash our own history and the reality lived by Black Americans. School boards, superintendents, and state legislators need to hear from us that these draconian efforts to limit what can be taught at age-appropriate levels at public institutions in the interest of short-term partisan political gain only perpetuate systems of oppression. Write letters, make phone calls, attend meetings, show up to make known that the values of tolerance and empathy, of treating others with kindness and recognizing shared humanity despite or ideally because of difference, are being assaulted through another particularistic attack on the black community. Silence is like a scent we read in the Talmud and we cannot be silent. And the time it turns out to do all of this is right now. Rage against masks and heeding the guidance of public health officials is quickly parlaying into efforts to stop conversations about racism and anything that might be remotely related to critical race theory. With just five minutes of your time, you can pick up the phone and support your public school officials' diversity, equity, and inclusion plans. With 10 minutes of your time, you can send an email supporting age-appropriate lessons in history, social studies, and America's sordid history with race. With two hours of your time, you can participate in a school board meeting or elected official town hall to share your family's story and how you know that discrimination can be more than just a few bad apples. While there's no comparison to be made between the types or degrees of harm inflicted on Jews and Blacks in America, white Jews in America have barely walked a step, let alone a mile, in Black shoes. Our own history is to know from categories of discrimination, individuals acting on their prejudices and systemic institutionalized barriers to success that have taken central stage in American public discourse today. Raise your voice as others did for us, 
for a world free of racism, hate, and bigotry, step off the sidelines, ensure that the lessons of our past and the blessings of solidarity we know from personal experience don't stop with us.